All right, so it's one o'clock. We'll go ahead and, and get started here. Uh, welcome to uh, fun, with, fun with Python. Uh, we're gonna be working today uh, from a Jupyter notebook. And uh, I've set up a, it's called a binder hub, which is pretty cool. I just learned about this recently. Uh, so anyone can launch their own Jupyter notebook server uh, which will be pre-provisioned pre with uh, the notebook we're going to be working from, and you can follow along uh, on your own computer at home uh, or at work. Um, to do that, you can just go to the GitHub repository, uh, which is uh, at data science-practicum is the organization, and the repository is called compound-data-types. And if you scroll into the bottom area, there's a button, a not very large button, I probably should make that button bigger, but there's a button there that says launch binder. If you click that, uh, it will launch a binder like this. And I'm actually gonna work from the same thing. So we're all gonna have the exact same experience. Okay. And I'm just, Poking around at all the different, I have a Zoom chat window and a Facebook chat window. So I'm gonna try and keep up with questions that people uh, post there. Um, but uh, just me here, so I might not be right on top of it at all times. So I'm gonna open up this uh, notebook here, 2018 sets uh, That's gonna be the notebook we're working from. So uh, just to give an overview of what I'm planning to do here, I'm actually planning to do a fun with Python session like this uh, every Friday for the foreseeable future. Uh, I have um, a larger project that I'm interested in working on and I want to develop content for that project and share that content with everyone while I'm working on it. Uh, it's, it's around uh, Python and linear algebra and uh, so this is actually sort of leading into that, where we're going to start with the idea of compound data types. And today we're actually going to start with the simplest compound data type, which is the set. So we're going to work through some, some this is all going to be pure Python. We're not going to do any NumPy or Pandas or anything like that today. Uh, we will be working toward that in the future, but today this is just going to be pure Python. And, and just looking at this one uh, data type, the set. So um, just to set, set up your expectations, that's what we're going to be working on. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. If you're arriving late, you can uh, go to the GitHub repository. I pasted a link in the chat for Zoom and the chat for um, Facebook. And you can go there and launch a Jupyter server by clicking Launch Binder. And you'll be able to work through this notebook uh, on your uh, on yourself uh, at work or at home, uh, in addition to following along. So, uh, all right, let's go ahead and get started with this. So, uh, we're gonna be looking at compound data types in general. And by compound data types, I mean uh, a, a, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a simple data type or, you know, like a core data type in Python that has more than one value, so sets, lists, dictionaries, tuples, et cetera. But I wanna start just with sets today. Uh, it, while we're working through this notebook, I'm gonna use the assertion uh, frame, the, the assertion statement uh, that comes with, with Python. If you're not familiar with this, if you've never seen this before, uh, you do an assertion using the following syntax. Let me make this a bit bigger. So people should be able to see a little bit better. There we go. So uh, we're gonna be using assertion statements as we work through this. And they basically work in the following way. You either do, you write assert and then some expression that would evaluate to either true or false. And you can optionally add a message that will display if the statement evaluates to false. So for example, if like the simplest one would be assert true. So if the statement is true, the assert does nothing and it just sort of passes silently and keeps going. Uh, if the statement evaluates to false, it's going to raise an assertion error. And if you gave it a message, it's going to return that message as the error message. 
associated with the assertion error. So this is going to be um, a, sent uh, a framework that I'm going to use for uh, you know evaluating the things that we the, the statements that we make as we work through this. So if you've never seen this before, uh, I'm going to be using assertion statements. This is really useful when you're writing production code if you have some sort of check that you need to make before uh, your code moves on to the next phase of the process. So you know you could imagine uh, I'm just making something up, but imagine putting like a linear regression model into production. You might want to run an assertion. Uh, before using it that the model has been fit, uh, you know, just something simple like that. But obviously it can work with anything that um, that takes a Boolean uh, that's going to evaluate to a Boolean expression. So here, this is what happens when you when you have a, a false assertion. So it actually is going to throw an error. I wrapped it up in a try accept clause to catch the error. Uh, and so it's going to throw an error uh, with the error message. And the error message here is this is false. And so I just printed the error message right here and it says this is false. So uh, that's assertion statements. We're going to be using those throughout. Uh, just to get started, you know, we're basically starting from the beginning with Python here. So there are uh, a handful of values which uh, are constants in the Python, Python language. I'm sure you're familiar with all of these false, true, and none are the important ones that we're going to be looking at. And you know you can there's an intuition to these, so you, hopefully you understand them uh, to begin with. Uh, so you know false is obviously not equal to true. So this statement false is not equal to true is a true statement, so it passes the assertion. Uh, false is also not equal to none. And by the same token, none is not false. So each of these three assertion statements is true. Now there is a little bit of a weird thing with none, with the none value. And uh, what that is, is that none will actually evaluate to false in some context. So if I just assert none, it actually evaluates to false. Uh, so uh, there it goes. I just swapped out instead of doing, I did assert false, this is false before. Now I do assert none this is false, and it gets an assertion error. So none uh, will be false in some cases, but it's not the same thing as false. Uh, so here, assert not none is true, so it doesn't do anything. Um, great, so those are the, the main constants we're interested in, true, none, and, and false. And then of course, uh, Python has the numeric types that you're uh, no doubt familiar with. And I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, assign some numerical values of three different types, right? We've got uh, an integer right here, one, a floating point number of 2.4, and a complex number of three plus three j, where uh, j here is the square root of negative one. Uh, it corresponds to i in uh, mathematics, but we use j in Python. So I'm gonna assign these, uh, these three variables. So I have three variables, a, b, and c, and each of them has a value uh, corresponding to the ones that I've assigned. Uh, so I can, I, I can go ahead and look at these and, and they've been defined. Uh, one thing that's, that's interesting is that if you're used to other programming languages uh, that require you to specify what type a variable is going to be, so before you assign the variable, you have to tell it this is a float or an int or a complex, you don't do that in Python. Uh, you never tell a variable what type it's going to be because if, with Python, they can actually uh, change. So we didn't do that at all. We just assigned the value to the variable and now we have them. Uh, we can look at the types of these variables and we have uh, the type of each one. And one thing that's interesting about uh, how I've displayed these uh, types here is that I've displayed them from uh, most restrictive to least restrictive. So uh, you can make an integer into a float without losing information. And you can make a float into a complex without losing information, but you can't go the other way. So if I try to turn B into an integer, I'm actually gonna lose the point four. I'm gonna lose information. So here, uh, I actually am gonna do that. I'm gonna change A into a float and B into an int. And you see that it works fine going one way, but it doesn't work fine going the other way. So integer is the most restrictive uh, numeric data type and complex is the least restrictive. Any of the others 
uh, I can change a complex number, I'm sorry, I can change any number into a complex and not lose information. And if I try to change something from, uh, if I try to change C, which is complex, into a float, I actually get an error. So uh, Python actually complains and says, I, you can't convert a complex into a float. Uh, so, yeah. So, okay, here we get to sets. This is, and this is the meat of what we, uh, we, we want to talk about here in this webinar. This webinar. Uh, a set is the uh, simplest compound data type. Uh, a compound data type is a single object that contains many values. Uh, so an, a set in Python is a single object that contains many unique values. That's sort of what makes a set a set. It's compound, but every uh, element in the set is unique. Uh, one interesting thing is that set was not always part of Python. Uh, and you can actually read the Python enhancement proposal or PEP uh, proposing to add the set type. You can read that by following this link uh, at your leisure. Uh, so set is itself a type. So if I ask uh, what is, what's the type of set, set is a type. Uh, in terms of mathematics, uh, a set is a collection of distinct, uh, which are, another way of saying unique, uh, objects. So it, this is essentially a statement of the, the two basic properties of a set. Uh, one of those is that a set is composed of elements, and two is that the elements are unique. So here I'm going to define a set uh, by saying that uh, A, big A, is, uh, has the elements A, B, 2.4 and C. So, and then we can make, we can uh, write a Boolean expression to see if uh, one is in A, if one is, is part of the set A, and we can see it is because uh, little a is the value one. So that passes, that, that, that assertion statement passes. One is an element of A. And mathematically, we can write this like this. We can say that this actually reads exactly like that. One is an element of A. Uh, and you know, if we open this guy up here, I'll, I'll do that real quick. We can look at the LaTeX that I used to write that. And uh, I write this, right? I write one is in A. So uh, what I'm trying to do here by showing you the LaTeX and by looking at the Python and by thinking about the math is that regardless of whether we think about sets in terms of math, in terms of uh, LaTeX, in terms of Python, in terms of all these different ways of thinking about sets, the, the most important thing of a set is that uh, an element is in that set. It belongs to that set. So that, like, this is the main idea of a set, this idea of membership. Elements are members of a set, and a set contains elements. So uh, there's, a, there's this term cardinality, which is a, a pretty fancy math term. Um, what it means, to just make it simple, is that the cardinality of a set is the number of unique elements in that set. So we uh, remember elements of a set have to be unique. So uh, that's sort of, it's almost redundant, but the cardinality is the number of elements in a set. So we defined A back up here. We said A was a set that had four elements, but when I ask for its length, uh, which is the Pythonic way to get this cardinality, the length is actually three. And this is because I passed it the value 2.4, but that's the same value as B. So this is actually a repeated value, and it's only going to be added once. So uh, B is 2.4. And then if I, you know, if I look at A, I can see that it's only got the three values, 1, 2.4, and 3 plus 3J. Because 2.4, uh, I can add it twice. I can add it five times to the set, but uh, the set is only concerned about unique elements. Um, so one sort of like the, you know, the, the, the fun thing to think about fun, if you, if you are like me and you enjoy math, the, the fun thing to think about with sets is this idea of equality. So, uh, of set equality. So here I'm defining B, which is, uh, which actually has, uh, five elements. Uh, we've got, uh, one, 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 2.4 and three plus uh, 3j, and this five elements in terms of the definition. Um, but knowing what we know about sets, it's going to have a cardinality of three, because one is, even though I've added one three times, 
it's only going to be a member of the set once. An, an element can only be a member once. So uh, let's go ahead and, and let's assert that A equals B. And that assertion evaluates to true. A and B are equal to each other. And so the assertion passes and uh, it passes silently like a, a passing assertion does. So let's make a new set, C, where C is just uh, little a and little c. And remember, little a is 1, and little c is 3 plus 3j. Three so that's the set C. And C is not uh, equal to a. So uh, this assertion passes. A is not equal to C. C is not equal to a. Uh, and the, uh, this is obvious because uh, the element uh, 2.4, or b, is not a member of C. So that assertion passes. So, uh, you know, we might take this set C and use a for loop to iterate over every element that's in C. So I'm going to take the set C and write a for loop over the set C. So for each element in C, I'm going to print the element and then whether or not that element is in A. So this is either going to be true or false. So here, let's just run it. There's only two elements. So there's two elements in C, and the, fir the first one we get uh, is one, and one is an element of A, so that's true. And the second element we get is three plus three J, which is also an element of A, so uh, that's true. So this leads to the, the, uh, the math idea of a subset. So if uh, every element in one set is also an element of another set, then you can say that uh, that set is a subset of the other set. So every element in C is also an element of A. So we can say that C is a subset of A. And, uh, you know, Python has this fancy way of writing it, C dot is subset A, and that's going to evaluate to true. So the assertion passes. But you can also write this uh, using less than or equal to. So it's sort of interesting to think about set equality and to think about a set being less than another set. So if a set is less than another set, that, that indicates that it's a subset. So uh, C, is, C is indeed less than or equal to A. C is a subset of A. So uh, what's interesting is that, and this should probably be a capital A, right? What's interesting is that A is actually a subset of, of itself. So this assertion is also going to pass. A is less than or equal to A. And in this case, it's because I said less than or equal to. So A is equal to A. So we can actually use this, uh, this idea of subsets uh, to write a definition of set equality. So uh, we could say that two sets are equal to each other if and only if each set is a subset of the other. So we've got, we already established that A is equal to B, but here we can sort of do a, a mathematical definition. So we can say uh, A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to A. And if both of these pass, we know that A is equal to B. And we can actually write a, a little Python function that establishes that. So I, I've got this function here, uh, is equal, and I'm going to pass it uh, set one and set two as the arguments to the function. So uh, I've got uh, two conditional statements here. So if set one is less than or equal to set two and set two is less than or equal to set one, I'm going to return true. Otherwise, I'm going to return false. So what's interesting about this, uh, about uh, uh, a, a, an if statement with an, uh, with an and in it, a, a conjoined if statement, is if the first one fails, it's just going to immediately return false. It's not even going to evaluate the second one. Uh, so it's going to check both of them, ultimately. And if they both are true, it's going to return true. And otherwise, it's going to return false. So we can define that function uh, eventually. OK, there it goes. And so I can use an assertion statement to see if A is in fact equal to B. And uh, the assertion is passing. And I can also assert that, uh, that 
A and C are not equal. This is sort of a wacky way of saying this, right? It almost reads, but it doesn't quite read for a human. I'm saying uh, assert not is equal A, C. Sort of, we're sort of getting into like, computer speak here, but uh, the intent is, is clear, I think. So uh, using this, we've established that um, two sets are equal if and only if they have the exact same members. Um, so, you know, as we're moving, we're going to be moving into uh, into moving into working with eventually with uh, with NumPy arrays, and NumPy arrays uh, require that uh, every element in the array have the same uh, the same uh, underlying uh, data type. So the same, you know, they it, we would need them all to be numeric, or need them all to be strings, or all to be uh, um, lists or whatever, they all have to be the same type. So we might be interested in this idea of a homogeneous set. And it's not something that's built into Python, but uh, it's something that we can write uh, pretty, pretty, it's gonna be a little, a little tricky if you've never seen it before, but it's not that complicated. Uh, so it'll be a, a, a nice exercise in uh, writing our own class. So uh, what we're going for is, you know, we, we had these sets A and B, and they were composed of elements that were, uh, you know, one of them was an integer, one of them was a float, and one of them was a complex. Here, let's, let's look at that again. So we have A here, which is these three elements. And, uh, you know, so we can even for element in A, print type element. And you can see that, you know, there are, three different types. So I might want to only allow sets where everything is the same type. This is something that could be useful to me as a, a computer scientist. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to extend the set class. And if, you've, if you haven't done uh, any object-oriented programming, this is probably something that, uh, this might be a little bit of a stretch, but I think it's a good stretch. I think that uh, if you follow along, you should be okay, and, and I'll, I'll take us through this, and it won't be too bad. Um, so uh, what we're going we're, we're gonna to do is extend the set class, and the way that this is going to work is we're going to define uh, a new class called homogeneous set that's going to inherit from set. Uh, so this is the syntax that we use to, to define a new class with this inheritance in Python. So this is going to be the name of our new class, homogeneous set, and it's going to inherit from uh, from set. That's going to be that's what's going to go right here in uh, the parentheses after the, the new class name. So here we've got a basic fun, uh, new class definition uh, for homogeneous set, and it, it doesn't do the the check for us just yet. Uh, it's right now all it's doing is inheriting from the set class. So I've got a class called homogeneous set uh, that's going to inherit from the base, the base class, the, uh, the, the, the class set in Python. And so what it's, gonna do, what it's doing here is whenever we, we, we make a new class, we have to define what's going to happen when we initialize a, a new object, an, an object that is of that class. Um, if you're not familiar, I probably should say a, 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 a brief thing about object-oriented programming. If you have no idea what I'm talking about with objects and classes, uh, one way to think about it is uh, like cars is always the classic example that people people give. So uh, you know, I drive a Toyota Prius, so that's a class of car, right? Toyota Prius is a, a is a defined class of car, and the definition for the Toyota Prius, uh, you know, it exists in blueprints somewhere in the uh, you know, in the, the, the servers of the Toyota Corporation, there's a definition for what a, a Prius is. And that's, that would be the class, the class Toyota Prius. Now, my Prius would be an object. Uh, it's, it was, uh, someone made a new Prius and, and I uh, purchased it. And, and so I have an object of the class Prius. So uh, what we're talking about here is we're defining our own class, homogeneous set, and then later on, we're going to create a new object that is a, a homogeneous set. So 
any class definition uh, has this, we use what's called the, the dunder init method. And dunder comes from the fact that uh, we've got double underscores on either side of the init method. And these are sort of uh, like special system level functions for working in Python. And so when you define a new class, you use this dunder init and you define what's going to happen when a new object in the class is initialized. So whatever is, whatever is part of this dunder init definition is what's going to happen when you make a new homogeneous set. So what's going to happen when we make our homogeneous set is it's actually going to run the initialization function of the set class, which makes sense because what we want is to store the values of the set and the exact of the homogeneous set in the exact same way that we store the values for a set. We just want to add something new. We want to add some checks after we store those values. So the first thing that a homogeneous set is going to do when we make a new one is it's going to store the values in the, it's going to initialize itself as if it was a regular set. And that's what I'm doing right here. This is, even if you've seen object-oriented programming in Python before, this might be a little bit tricky. Uh, if you've never seen it, it might, it, it'll be very tricky. And either way, it probably is worth, uh, you know, sitting and thinking about uh, at some point. Uh, so let's go ahead and define that. And now we've defined the class homogeneous set. And the next thing to do with the class that we've defined is to uh, instantiate them, to, to, make, to make two objects of the class and just see how they work. So uh, I'm using the class uh, to define uh, homogeneous set one and homogeneous set two. And so I just, I, I use the, the, the class object here and I pass in uh, the values that I want to go into the set. So let's make those. So homogeneous set one is going to be the, uh, the integers one, two, and three. And you can see it looks just like a, a, a regular set. And then homogeneous set two that looks just like our, our previous set A, right? And actually it is the exact same values as A. I bet I could even do this if I wanted to be fancy. I could do uh, assert A equals homogeneous set two. And in fact, that evaluates the true. So they are in fact the same set. Um, so, you know, you can point out that homogeneous set at this point behaves exactly as set does. And in fact, uh, we know that A has different data types, uh, has uh, integer, float, and complex. So it's not behaving as a homogeneous set yet. We actually need to add something additional to it in order for it to uh, behave that way. So, um, you know, we might look at homogeneous set one and see, and, and again, for each element in the set, print the type, and we see that uh, indeed they are all integers. They have each one as an integer. This is what we want. This is an homogeneous set where they all three, all of the elements in this set have the same data type. And we could do the same thing for homogeneous set two. And we can see this is not a homogeneous set. It has three different data types. It has integers, floats, and complex. So this, this, is, this is, according to what we're trying to do, this is bad. We don't want to allow uh, an homogeneous set that has three different data types. So, uh, what I wanted to do is uh, write a little, uh, uh, write some code to check to see if each element in a set uh, does have the same data type. So uh, I start here. This is this is a little bit of extended Python. So I start here. I say base type equals none. So I'm starting with nothing. I don't know because I I don't want to them to all be integers necessarily or all be floats, I want, it to, I want to allow it to be any data type it wants. They just all have to be the same. So I'm starting with a base type of none, and then I'm going to write a loop, another for loop, for each element. And this, this time I'm going to look at just homogeneous set one. So for each element in homogeneous set one, if the base type is none, so the first time I go through the loop, the base type will be none because I've established it right up here. So for the first element that I look at, the base type's going to be none, and it's going to run this. It's going to say base type equals type of element. So the first time I run through the list, I'm going to set the base type to be the type of the first element 
uh, in the set. I'm sorry, the, I said the first the element in the list. I should have said the first time I run through the elements in the set, uh, I'm going to look at the type of the first element and make that the base type. Now, uh, I'm going to run through the second element. And at this point, uh, base type is no longer none. Now we've set it to be a type. So for homogeneous set one, at this point, base type would be int, and we would go on to the next step. And so now I'm going to compare base type to the type of the current element I'm looking at. And if they're not the same, it's going to print this set is heterogeneous or heterogeneous in, in type. So let's run this on homogeneous set one. This is also a, a, a complicated uh, bit of code that uh, if, if you're new to Python, I mean, we're doing all of the basic sorts of things, like right? we're using for, uh, for loops, we're using uh, if else statements, we're, we're checking data types, uh, but uh, it might be complicated for you if you've never seen this before. And I think I'm running into a server where we're all on the same one and we're all running a little bit slow. So uh, that's not good. Um, I can't even, I, I have a, a connecting to kernel issue. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, real quickly just boot up my own local Jupyter so that I can make sure to continue with, with the session. Uh, and we'll have to figure out how to make sure that we all have enough resources to work on these as we're going forward. Uh, so, thanks everyone for bearing with me. Uh, this is the first time we're doing this, and we have to work out all the bugs. All right. And I'm just going to reset the window that I'm sharing with just to make sure that. Uh, I'm using the right one. Okay, and I gotta get back to where I was in the notebook. If you've never run a Jupyter notebook before, I probably should have told you shift enter is how you execute the code in a cell. Uh, my apologies for not saying that at the top. All right, so we're back to where we started. Uh, let me just see if anyone, uh, no comments yet. All right. Okay, so we're checking this guy here. Uh, and we did indeed find uh, as we were able to tell from visual inspection that uh, homogeneous set one is homogeneous. Uh, it only has, um, and they all have the same data type, and that's what we want. So let's check homogeneous set two using the exact same code. Uh, I'm just going to run this guy right here. And we get, so it's actually printing a statement for each element, which isn't exactly what we want. We don't want to, we, what we want is for it to, tell us it's, it's heterogeneous in type and not do anything else. Uh, see, at the end, it's even telling us that it's homogeneous in type, which that's, this is not a correct statement. Uh, homogeneous set two has three different data types. So uh, it's not exactly what we want. So what I actually did, I added a little bit of code here uh, where I'm setting uh, some variable homogeneous equals true at the start. And then if, uh, and then when we find that it's not homogeneous, we set homogeneous to false, and we only print this last statement if homogeneous is still true. So here we go. And now we only get the single statement. This set is heterogeneous in type. And that's exactly what we want because it's, it's not a homogeneous set. And this is the check that we're, that we're trying to do. So uh, what we can do is take this, this code that we're working with and turn it into a function. Uh, you know, we want to be able to just pass in any set and have it checked. So I'm writing a function here 
called uh, type is homogeneous, and we're going to pass in some defined set. Again, we're going to start with a base type of none because we're allowing any base type just as long as they're all the same base type. So we're going to have a base type of none, and then for uh, each element in the defined set, if the base type is none, make the base type the type of the first element, and from then on, compare the base type to each subsequent element. And if they're not the same, return false. If they are the same, return true. So let's see how this works. We can use one of our assertion statements again. So what I'm asserting is that homogeneous set one uh, is, does have homogeneous type so that uh, I got to run this function. So homogeneous set one is homogeneous and I'm saying that homogeneous set two is not homogeneous and both of those uh, assertion statements pass. So having this function, this type is homogeneous function that we just wrote, we can actually use this to turn the class that we're working on into actually being uh, an homogeneous set. So here we go, we've got this code here. We still have the same, uh, the same uh, initialization process where during the initialization, we're calling the set initialization function. But I've also added this type is homogeneous function. And you'll note that I'm calling it, I'm passing the variable self here. So again, I'm gonna check the base type. If the base type is none, make the base type the type of the first element. Uh, and, if, and then compare it to each subsequent element. Now, I'm not returning a false. What I'm doing at this point, if they're not the same, is actually raising an error. I'm raising a type error with the message, all elements of the set must have the same type. And I'm doing this because if they don't have the same type, I don't want it to actually work. I want it to fail, and I want it to fail loudly. Quiet failure is the worst thing that you can have in computer programming. You can have uh, something pass quietly, but if it's gonna fail, you want it to fail loudly so you know that it's failing. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna, what I do is I use this type is homogeneous function in the initialization process. So it gets, what, gets, what happens is the homogeneous set uh, gets initialized with its values and then uh, runs the type is homogeneous function on itself. Uh, so itself is the set, is the set of numbers. So when we're looking at, when we're iterating through the, the elements, we say for element in self. Itself is the, the, the set is the set of numbers that are the set of numbers or, or any, you know, the set of, of, of members that we're looking at. So let's go ahead and define this guy. And we can define homogeneous set one. This one should work because uh, they all have the same type. And then here I even make homogeneous set two where uh, they have a different type. They all have floating point values, but they're still all the same type. So this should work, and it does. Now I've got this third set, which has two integers and a floating point number, and this one should not work. And in fact, it fails with a type error. And when we read through the error message, we get type error, all elements of the set must have the same type, which is exactly what we want. So there you go, we've created a homogeneous set. Uh, I don't know, you know, like when we're really going to be working with, with uh, homogeneous objects, we're going to allow, we're going to use uh, NumPy arrays that have been written by uh, people a lot smarter than me uh, who've handled a lot more of the edge cases and everything. Uh, but this is a good exercise in seeing how to create a class uh, and thinking about having homogeneous uh, compound objects and thinking about compound data objects uh, themselves, period. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this session. Uh, we're going to do another one next Friday where we will talk about uh, comprehensions, set comprehensions, and possibly even moving into uh, comparing sets and lists uh, and looking at uh, list comprehensions as well. So um, I, we have uh, 20 more minutes. I, I, you don't have to stick around, but if you do have some questions about anything that we did here, uh, you can throw them into the, the Zoom chat. 
uh, or the Facebook chat and I can take some questions. Uh, yeah, feel free to ask about Python, about Jupyter, about anything that we've talked about today. So I'm taking it from the fact that there are no questions that I was crystal clear. Everything was just, the, the ideas just leapt from the computer straight into your brains. You understood everything perfectly. Uh, I, I'll give you a few more minutes in case anything comes to you. I can say while we're, while we're thinking about this, uh, I did use uh, Binder Hub to present this uh, to everyone. So Binder Hub is, uh, it's an extension to the Jupyter Hub platform. Uh, Jupyter Hub is part of the Jupyter project. Uh, Binder Hub is also part of the, the Jupyter Hub project. Uh, so I hope that, I hope that um, uh, some folks uh, were able to, uh, to run that. Um, actually, uh, we do have a question from David H, who says, what went into setting up the shared Jupyter server? Uh, that's a great question, David. So it's actually uh, using uh, Docker and Kubernetes, uh, which are um, some pretty modern uh, infrastructure concepts. Uh, I actually wrote a book on uh, using Docker for working uh, with data science called Docker for Data Science uh, last year. Uh, you can pick that up on Amazon, uh, a little plug. Uh, so I'm, I, I really enjoy working with Docker. I teach all of my students uh, when, they're, when they're working with data science to use Docker to build their, their Jupyter platform. Uh, what Kubernetes is being used to do here is to uh, automatically allocate a uh, Docker node to each person who goes and signs up uh, on the same uh, on the same cluster. So Kubernetes is building a cluster, uh, which is, it's actually six, I think six CPUs on uh, the, Google, the Google Cloud platform that are tied together as a single cluster and get treated as a single Docker machine. And when you click launch binder, uh, you get allocated a node on that machine uh, with the uh, GitHub repository pre-provisioned on that node and then, you know, that, that's, there it is for you. That's what went into it. Um, and, you know, like this all sounds really complicated, but I got to say, like, I read this documentation here and, like, worked through this, these steps right here. Like, I, I did not invent anything. I basically worked with the documentation that uh, Jupyter Hub and Binder Hub have prepared here. Um, were were awesome so you know i think it's more a testament um to working it's a testament to this documentation than to like my prowess with it was my first time working on a, a kubernetes project so uh but it was fun and kubernetes is it's a really exciting project and it's one of those those skills that's hard to pick up but once you have it it's heavily heavily in demand um, so if you wanted to work as, say, a DevOps engineer, Kubernetes is, is one of, Docker and Kubernetes are like the principal skills um, for, for working as a DevOps or a site reliability engineer. Yeah, it, uh, Sylvia says that um, Kubernetes and uh, Geek or the Google Container Engine, uh, she's going to use those for a demo she leads next time. And absolutely, they're awesome for, for demos like this. It was, it was so easy. Like I, I, I think I, like I floundered a bit setting up uh, the cluster yesterday, but when I say floundered, I mean maybe like an hour and a half or two hours setting up the cluster. And then setting up Binder Hub took me maybe 45 minutes. Uh, if you've got Docker knowledge, uh, and even that, like it was, like this documentation is fantastic. Uh, here, why don't I throw a link to this documentation? here in the, the Zoom chat. So if anyone wants to have a look, uh, they can. And then here's the Jupyter Hub documentation as well.
Cool. Well, um, you know, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, I, I do teach a class, uh, a 10 week bootcamp at UCLA extension on, uh, learning to, to do data science. Uh, we're starting a new session at the end of September. It's, there are no prerequisites. So I'm seeing a lot of Animo justice folks, uh, showing up to listen in. Uh, there's no, no prereqs in terms of taking the class. Uh, Anyone is welcome, and I don't assume anything in terms of, actually I do, I'm sorry, I assume one thing. I assume that you know y equals mx plus b. Uh, that's the only thing I assume, so. Um, yeah. Let me just say that one more time though. Shout out to all the Animo Justice folks that showed up. Cool. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming out. I will make the recording available on YouTube as well, and I'll put the link uh, on the, uh, the meetup page. And I hope to see you all next Friday as well. All right, bye.